you've got your Bibles, you can turn to my on. Can you guys hear me? I'm on? Okay, I think I'm on. Yeah, there we go. Okay, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 15. We are continuing our series this morning and looking through the parables of Jesus. Uh, before we get started, though, there was one more announcement that, that Steve had uh, meant to do and was going to come up, but I offered to do it before here. Uh, Richard and Ada Caswell were longtime members here. Their son, Ricky, passed away Friday morning in Georgia. So if you know them, know the family, be praying for them. Um, and... and all who are involved um, there. Uh, But this morning, we are in uh, Luke chapter 15. We are continuing our series in the the parables of Jesus. As you're turning there, I want to tell you about Garrett Kell. Garrett Kell, in 1998, was a college student at Virginia Tech. Uh, He lived off campus in an an apartment, um, and and Garrett lived the, the party lifestyle. Drugs, alcohol, girls, you name it. Garrett was involved in it. And so one night, um, actually it was Halloween night, uh, 1998, Garrett is going to throw a, a party at his apartment. And it's going to be a, a big Halloween party uh, with all of what was just named um, a second ago. Garrett decides, I'm going to invite Dave. Dave was uh, a friend of his in high school. They used to party together. Um, go, went to different colleges, but was close enough to where he could invite him and he would come over. Um, he had acquired all of Dave's favorite vices uh, and, and had had them ready for when Dave got there. Well, Dave came in the front door. And Garrett took him upstairs and um, said, hey, I've got your favorite drugs and alcohol, and I even know a, a girl that you can hang out with and get to know this weekend. And Dave closed the door and sat down on the bed and said, Garrett, I can't, I can't do that stuff anymore. And Garrett was a little confused and says, why not? He says, well, I've, I've given my life to Christ. Um, and I'm, I'm now a Christian and I don't, I don't live that way that I used to live anymore. Well, this kind of struck Garrett as odd, seeing that he had, had partied with Dave before in the past. Uh, but it wasn't going to ruin his, his Halloween party. Dave stayed, um, didn't partake in what was going on, but stayed and hung out with Garrett, hadn't seen him in a bit, endured some ridicule and mocking at the party, but left. Well, Garrett became a bit haunted by Dave, and Dave's got peace, joy, and he's kind of weird now, uh, and so he said, I'm going to reach back out to him. So they had conversations back and forth. He would, he would, Garrett would ask Dave, man, I've got some questions about this. Well, what about that? And, and what about this? And Dave would answer his questions patiently. Um, and then it, it kind of came to a head where Garrett said, you know what? I'm, I'm done with all of this. I don't, want, I don't want anything to do with it. And he wrote Dave a letter. And in the letter, he, he basically says, hey, um, you're, you're kind of weird. Like, you're not the Dave that I, I knew um, be careful to not get too radical in this. Like, I, I don't want to see you turn into somebody else. Um, and in the letter, he, he kind of writes, hey, me and God have an understanding. Right? He's okay with what, I'm, with what I'm doing, which clearly, according to Scripture, he's not. But he's, he's okay with what I'm doing. And um, at the end of the letter, he gives kind of this arrogant, I tell Jesus I said hi. Well, Garrett says, in his, despite his show of arrogance, he's still haunted. And something is still not sitting right with him. He says when he's home on Christmas break, he, he goes into his room and he sees his Bible underneath his bed. There's the corner of it that his mother had bought him um, a long time ago. He says he closes the door and takes the, the Bible out and he's going to play Bible roulette, which is always a bit of a dangerous game. And he opens up to, to Ezekiel chapter 18. And in that passage, God tells the Israelites, um, Turn from your sin. If you don't turn from your sin, you're going to face eternal consequences. And that freaks him out. He says, I've got to try this again. He closes the Bible, opens it again to Romans chapter 2. In Romans chapter 2, Paul's writing about God's kindness and his grace and mercy and how he desires for uh, his people to leave their sin and come and follow him. Well, that disturbs him even more. He's like, I've got to call Dave. So he calls Dave. And Dave comes over and Garrett says, I, I, I need to, to talk through what, what I've been reading. And, Garrett, and Dave said, you're never going to believe what I was doing when you called me. Dave said, I was like I have been since, every day since Halloween. I was praying for you to come to know Jesus. And Garrett said, he asked him some questions. Dave shared the gospel with him. He said, I wasn't sure if it was that evening or over the next week or so as they continued to have conversations. But Garrett gave his life to Christ. 
You can read this story. It's on Gospel Coalition. Just type in Garrett Kell testimony. Uh, Garrett's a pastor now. He's uh, somewhere on the East Coast. I don't quite remember. But his story is, uh, is an example of how God works to save even the farthest of sinners. And our parable today is the story of how Jesus shows that God uses his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy to, sh- to save the farthest of those who are far from him. This morning we are in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger." I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. We'll stop there. I know it's in the middle of the verse, but we're going to stop right there in the middle of verse 20. Jesus tells this parable. He starts with a, a family unit. We have a father and we have two sons. And the younger son comes to him and, and says, will you give me my inheritance? Which is, we probably know, have heard this before, uh, is basically telling, the son telling the father, I wish you were dead so I could go ahead and get what's coming to me at the end of your life. The father, for some reason, go ahead, goes ahead and, and gives him the inheritance. Right? I'm not sure my family would have done the same. They would have been, well, tough. <laughs> you, uh, if, if, you do, if, if that's the way it is, that, that's the way it's going to be. But the father gives the, his share of the inheritance and the son leaves. In effect, saying, I no longer want to be part of this family. I want to take what uh, monetary value I could have gotten from you. I want to take that and then cut all ties and leave. The younger son leaves. Uh, and when he does, he goes and it says he, he squanders his money. He squanders his property in reckless living. The man lives it up. He's partying. He's, he's spending his money freely. And we don't know how much time passes between when he t- takes the money and leaves and when he finds himself in this next state where he's poor, he has no money, he has no food, and there's a famine in the land. We don't know how much time has passed. Could be a long time, could be a little bit of time. But regardless, he's out of money. He's run out of money, uh, and he needs to figure out a solution quickly. So the younger son uh, notices a a pig farmer. He hires himself out to work for this pig farmer. Now back in the beginning of chapter 15, why Jesus is telling these parables starts back in chapter 15, verse 1. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Verse 3, so he told him this parable. And then Jesus goes on to tell a couple of parables. But the reason he's telling this parable is because the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling about Jesus taking in the tax collectors and the sinners. Now, Pharisees, as we know, are Jewish. They're Jewish religious leaders. So when they hear that the man has hired himself out, the younger son has hired himself out to a a pig farmer, they're going to be appalled. They will recognize that he has hit rock bottom because pigs are unclean. You don't touch pigs. You have nothing to do with pork if you are Jewish. So the man hires himself out to a a pork farmer, a pig farmer, uh, and he sends him out into the field to feed the pig. So not only does he work for a pig farmer, now he's living and working among the pigs. And then it gets worse. In verse 16, he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. And now he's hungry. He looks around and says, man, if, I, if only I could just eat what they're eating, then I wouldn't be hungry anymore. And the Jewish religious leaders would think this man has hit the absolute bottom. There's, he can't, his life cannot get any worse. He's poor, he's hungry, uh, he's needy, and he's living among the pigs, wishing that he could eat the pig's food. And then he has this epiphany in verse 17. It says, when he came to himself, 
He said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? And you see him kind of realize, maybe I could just hire myself out back to my family. I'm no longer part of the family. I've, I've terminated my sonship right, with, my, with my family, but maybe I could be a servant. Maybe I could go work. At least I might get a little bit of money and I might get some, some food that's better than what these pigs are eating. So this is what he decides to do. He, he says, I'm going to rise. I'm going to go to my father and I'll say to him. And here's where the man starts to practice his apology. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. All right, and if you have uh, ever had to apologize, which everybody here has had to apologize, maybe you practice it before you say it. I've done this before, right? You're, you're like, I want to get every word right, so I'm going to practice it. And you can picture this son kind of walking back the path towards his, his father's house, going, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called one of your sons. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, practicing practicing it to get the words right. But what he's doing is not just creating a script. He's showing that he recognizes his sin. That this act of repentance is because he has sinned before God. He has sinned before his father. Practices this speech In verse 20, we have, and he arose and came to his father. When Jesus tells this story about the younger son, he's relating it to the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the sinners who are sitting with him and are are having a meal with him. And Jesus uh, sees their station in life and calls them to repent in turn. Uh, We... uh, we want Jesus, or we, we understand uh, that, that Jesus desires that all come to him, but he doesn't leave them as they are. He's calling the, the younger son to, to repent, which means he's calling the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the sinners who are sitting with him to repentance. Repentance looks like the younger son. It involves a recognition of sin, and it involves a return. For us to repent, we have to recognize that we've sinned. And he shows that that sin is horizontal and vertical. Horizontally, we sin against each other. We sin against one another and, and strain and break those relationships. But it's also vertical. As he says, I have sinned against heaven. And our sin strains and breaks our relationship with God. If we are going to practice repentance, we have to follow the example of the younger son. We have to recognize our sin and then we have to return. He could sit around and go, man, I made a mistake. I've done something wrong. I, I, I've screwed up with the money that I was given. And he could just stay there. But that wouldn't be real repentance, right? His real repentance is when he returns to go back to his father, to apologize, to reconcile that relationship. This is, what he, this is what Jesus is calling the, the sinners to do, and specifically in this passage, but in the, the whole message of the Bible. He calls us to repent, to turn. And maybe when you read the story of the younger son this morning, maybe you relate. Maybe you recognize that you are very far from God, that you are living a, a life in outright rebellion, as we would say of the younger son. Maybe this is you. And if this is you, and you're here this morning, I I hope and I pray that the Lord uh, softens your heart so that that you hear the gospel and recognize, I need to repent. I need to turn from my sin and, and trust the Lord for forgiveness. Because when you repent and when you turn, uh, you have the Father, which is the next section of of this parable. Let's pick back up in verse twenty. It says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. 
you can picture the, the younger son coming up the path and the father seeing him. And it says that he, he had compassion and he ran. Right? And this is uh, undignified for, for men of, of this age in this context. Right? And some of you might say it's still undignified to run. Uh, you can argue with me afterwards. Uh, but at this time, he, he, he runs and embraces him and, and kisses him. Right? Signs of affection. Signs of a family relationship. See, the word for embraced there in, uh, in verse 20 is the same word that Moses uses in, uh, in Genesis when Jacob sees Joseph for the first time in Egypt. After he thought Joseph was eaten and, and killed by a wild animal, when in reality he was sold off into slavery, he hasn't seen him for many, many years. Jacob embraces Joseph, and the father in the parable here embraces his son. We see the kind compassion of the father the tender love, and the willingness to bring him back in. And if you think what this son has said to the father, basically, I wish you were dead. Go ahead and give me my money so I can leave and not be a part of this family anymore. But there would be a temptation in the father to think, well, he left. I'm cutting off this relationship. I'm taking him back. He deserves his, his discipline. He deserves the, the consequences of, uh, of, of his actions. That's not what he does. He embraces him, kisses him, shows him this, this fatherly affection. And the son, you, you can picture that the father's got the, this big embrace around him. He's, he's hugging him and the, the son, I'm sure he feels a little awkward because uh, he knows what he's done. And he he kind of pushes away and then he, he starts on to his speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But if you notice, in that part when the son recites it, he's missing something. Right? He's missing this, treat me as, uh, as one of your hired servants that he says back in 19 when he starts to practice his speech. He's missing that part. It's not because he left it off and thought, I'm not going to say that. It's because the father interrupts him. You can have this, I have this picture in my mind of the father going, ah, bup, bup, stop. And him turning to the servants and saying, bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. And he interrupts his apology and his speech. And instead of chastising him, he brings out the best robe, shoes, and prepares to throw a party. See, according to Deuteronomy chapter, one, or chapter 21, uh, the father had every right to, to have his son stoned and killed as part of this discipline for, for what had uh, happened earlier in the story. He doesn't go that far. He doesn't even go so far as to let him finish to where he, he says, well, yeah, you could just be one of my hired servants. I'll pay you. You can live and live with the servants and eat their food and um, you just live out there. You're not a part of us. He, he doesn't even do that. Instead, he welcomes him, brings him back in, restores his status, his wealth, his place at the table. Most importantly, his place in the family. And he says in verse 24, For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And he began to celebrate. He doesn't say this man was lost and is found. This man was, uh, was dead and is now alive. He says, my son. He's, he's uh, brought him back into the family. He's proud to be his father. I think about the, the movie uh, Rudy. It's about the, the guy that um, walks on to the Notre Dame football team. And he's real blue collar and he's small and doesn't have a, a whole lot of a, a shot. But he keeps working. He works hard and works hard. It's, it's a classic American sports movie where you just work hard enough you can make a division one college football team uh, but he walks on and uh, the, the dad is there at his first game and the, the Rudy runs out onto the field with the Notre Dame team um, and the dad's that's my son that's my son and he, it's a it's a great scene um, when he's sitting up in the, the stadium there and that's what the the father says this is my son he's returned He's, he was lost and is found. He was considered as good as dead and is alive again. This is my son. When you read Scripture 
Anytime you read the Bible, you want to look at two things. You want to look at, one, what does this passage tell me about God? And two, what does this passage tell me about me? A lot of times we struggle with going, what am I supposed to get from this, right? How, what can I learn? What can I do immediately from this? Sometimes not every passage is, is about what can I immediately do from this, but it's going to teach us about who we are and who God is. The, the younger son and then a little later the older son, they're going to teach us about our hearts. They're going to lay our hearts open and examine us for our motives. But right now, Jesus is teaching about the Father and about how we have a Father who runs, We have a Father who has compassion. We have a Father who's merciful and gracious and kind and forgiving and loving. We have a Father who practices undignified grace. This is the picture of the Father in the parable of the prodigal son. At the end of this passage in 24, for he was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. It's a, it's a refrain in the, the first two parables. In the first two parables of, of chapter 15, we've got the lost sheep that the shepherd goes and finds. And you see uh, in 6, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. We have something that was lost that is now found. And there's a rejoicing, a celebration. And then the parable of the lost coin. A woman loses one of her, her silver coins. Uh, and then she finds it and says in verse 9, rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I lost. We have something lost, something found, and rejoicing. The stakes are a little higher in the parable of the prodigal son. This isn't a a lamb, this isn't a coin, this is a person. But the result is the same. Something that was lost has been found. It's now time to celebrate. But then we come to the older son. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. He came and drew near to the house, and, or as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry, refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you. I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. When this son of yours came, he who, or who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead in his life. He was lost and is found. When you're reading through Luke 15, you've got a pattern. It's something lost, something found, celebration. Something lost, something found, celebration. Prodigal son, something lost, something found, celebration, and we have the difference. Remember where where Jesus, what Jesus is doing, he's sitting with the the tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, and the Pharisees are mad that he's sitting with them. How could you associate with with lowly people, with sinners, and you call yourself holy? As Jesus turns in the story to the older son, he's been looking at the, the uh, the prostitutes and the, the tax collectors and the sinners, kind of telling them about what was lost and found and celebrating, but now he's looking at the Pharisees because the older son here now represents this Jewish law, this, these Jewish religious leaders. As the older son, he, he's working out in the field and he comes and draws near to the house. He hears the music and the party and the dancing and he asks one of the servants, what's going on? What's happening at the house? The servant tells him, uh, your, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf. He's, he was gone and now he's back and lost and found. We're, we're all here to celebrate. And instead of celebrating, he gets angry. Verse 28. But he was angry and refused to go in. So his father comes out, says, and he entreated him. We'll come back to, to entreated. But see again the father going to the son. You've got the father running to the son, the younger son, when he comes back. You've got the father going to the the older son when he's pouting outside the back door. We don't just get, though, the the fact that the son is angry. We see the, uh, Luke tells us the, the story that the son was angry, but then he gives us some dialogue to show what the son is thinking. All these many years I've served you. I've never disobeyed your name. 
your command. You, I've, I've never shamed you. I've been faithful. I've been holy. And you never gave me a goat for my friends. Right? I'll be honest, that's not something I ever said to my parents. <laughs> I've said plenty of things uh, that I wish I could take back, but it was not, you never gave me a goat for my friends. But you hear the self-righteousness in this son. It's especially when he comes back down, he says, but when this son of yours, not even, but when my brother, he's, he's not claiming him, he's assigning him to the father, but when this son of yours goes and, and devours your property with prostitutes, you kill the fattened calf for him. You can hear the pride and the self-righteousness. And I've always been holy. I've always been here. I've always been obedient. And we, we bring it to a little more modern well, I've always shown up to church, and I've, I've always served on every committee, and I've never really done anything that bad, and I've always kept from running through the halls in the church, right? We could put anything in it, but this older son becomes this closeted legalist, where he says, you know, I've, I've drawn these lines where I assume where my holiness is, where I show that I'm so much better than this one who has squandered everything. Holier than thou. And what he really shows us is that he doesn't have God's heart. He may look nice and clean and holy and righteous on the outside, but his heart is cold and dead. There's no celebration that his son or that his brother is back. Could you imagine? Your sibling has walked out on you all those years. He comes back in repentance and you as the older, the older son, the older brother says, no, I don't want any more to do with him. I don't think that repentance is real. I don't believe it. This is where Jesus is turning to the Pharisees. See, when the father, when it says that the father entreated him, he's, he's inviting him to come into the party, to come back and celebrate because the, the younger son is back. And the lack of forgiveness and grace shows that the, the, the older son does not have this, this same relationship, does not have the same heart as we said of God. As a church, when we look at the story of the prodigal son, we, we desire for people who relate to the younger son to come join us, right? We, we want those who are far from God to come find the Lord, find the gospel, and give their life to Christ. We, we desire that. I, I pray for that. Hopefully you pray for that as well, that we see people who are far off come to know Jesus. Our temptation is not that we are going to wander off somewhere. Our temptation as a church, in any church, is usually the older son. When we start to say things like, well, they don't, they don't do the same things we've always done here. They don't act the same way we've always acted here. They don't look the way that we look here. And we don't celebrate because we feel that repentance is not true. Somebody's just putting on an act. This becomes our temptation to be like the older brother. But the best news about the prodigal son, from verse 11 down to verse 32, is that God offers forgiveness to the farthest of sinners. He offers forgiveness to the farthest of sinners. Now, when you hear that, you may think that's great for the prodigal son, but God desires both sons to come and repent and come to him. All right, he, he desires that the morally bankrupt, the, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the sinners, the convicted felons, the partiers, the Garrett Kells of the world, that they would come and follow him, give their life to him. And why would they do this? But because God is forgiving and gracious and merciful and loving and has provided a way to, to offer hope and life and salvation. God desires that those, the, the farthest of sinners, would come and follow him. But on the other side of that too, God desires that the, the outward re, outwardly religious would come to follow him. That they would stop putting on some front. That their hearts would soften to come to know Jesus and, and celebrate what God does. See the heart of God. All right. 
these, as Jesus is talking about the older son, looking at the Pharisees, these are the, the clean on the outside, but very rotten on the inside. God desires repentance for both. So this morning, when we think about the, the story of the prodigal son and what God is doing, what Jesus is doing when he's teaching this parable to the crowds, Showing us our, uh, showing us our reason for worship when it comes to salvation. And it's because each one of us, even though we we may not have lived lives like the younger son, we were like the younger son, all right, far off from the Lord, in need of a savior, in need of forgiveness and reconciliation. And He shows us that in our our salvation, we are. Uh, our, we repent, and the Father embraces us, draws us near to Him, restores our status, restores our place in the family, calls us sons and daughters. So when we think about our own salvation, we read this story, uh, we could be tempted to go, well, I've already been saved. I don't, this isn't for me. Hopefully this is for so-and-so who else is listening. But remember what Christ has done for you. I'm convinced that if we continue to remember, if we always remember what Christ has done for us and it changes the way we live and the way we act and the way we worship, the way we read our, our Bibles and changes everything about us is remembering what Christ has done for us. But he's also reminding us to not have the cold and calloused heart of the older son, but instead to, to soften your heart towards the way that the Lord is working. And finally, he's Reminding us of who he is. We have a a reminder in the prodigal son of who God is and what God has done for us. When we gather on a Sunday morning, we gather to worship this God. The God who saves the the younger son, the God who saves the the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the sinners, the Garrett Kells, the you name it. Cousins, family, friends, co-workers. As a church, I hope that we desire uh, to see the younger son Come through our doors and join us to to worship. I I hope that we go out to find the younger son and tell them the good news about Jesus, all while we protect our hearts from being the older son and looking down on those who need Jesus. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you uh, for the reminder of your goodness. I thank you um, for your forgiveness, your love, your mercy, grace. God, we would be nowhere without, uh, without you. We would be nowhere without your forgiveness and mercy for us. God, we are so grateful that you've saved us. God, I pray that you would save more, that we would uh, see your, your mighty hand working in our, our families and among our friends and uh, at our places of work. And God, we pray that we would see many come to know you. God, I pray that you would guard our hearts. Help us not to become cold or callous. Help us not to get lost in uh, whatever it is uh, we we get lost in. We lose sight of you. God, I thank you for for loving us. I thank you for uh, being with us. And I thank you for sending your son to die for us. In his name we pray. Amen. You come this morning as the Lord leads.